Part 2. Linguistic Evaluations of Tongue Talking Linguistic researchers have examined the language component of tongue talking and have come to the same conclusion as I have, that it is nothing more than babblings. Wikipedia notes that tongue talking consists of strings of syllables made up of sounds taken from all those that the speaker knows, put together more or less haphazardly but emerging nevertheless as word-like and sentence-like units because of realistic, language-like rhythm and melody. However, it is not a real language because neuroimaging of brain activity during tongue talking does not show activity in the language areas of the brain. From Glossolalia on Wikipedia, https colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash glossolalia accessed May 12th, 2020. This supports the conclusion that speaking in tongues is not an actual language spoken. This led researcher William J. Samarin to conclude that for its users, tongue talking is primarily a vocal, physical, emotional, and non-rational phenomenon. From Making Sense of Glossolalic Nonsense by William J. Samarin, https colon slash slash tspace dot library dot uteronto dot ca slash bitstream slash one eight zero seven slash six seven six one nine slash one slash making percent sign two zero cents percent sign two zero of percent twenty glossolalic percent twenty nonsense dot pdf accessed May twelfth, twenty twenty. This is exactly what I discovered to be true, having heard my grandmother speak in tongues for over twenty years. She used it as a physical, emotional response, done in the name of the Lord, in order to relieve stress in her life from the legalistic rules created by her church. Therefore, I believe Unger rightly concludes, the extensive evidence of church history and the effects of tongues on human experience, the emotional extremism, the unhealthy prophetism often manifest, the doctrinal ignorance and confusion, the divisive nature of the movements, the pride and empty conceit generated by erratic unscriptural experiences, all these point to the truth of Paul's inspired word, tongues shall cease, Unger 1971, 146. From Speaking in Tongues in the Restoration Churches by Lee Copeland https colon slash slash www.dialoguejournal.com slash wp dash content slash upload slash sbi slash article slash dialogue underscore v24n01 underscore 15.pdf accessed August 27th, 2020. Bethel Church Modern day tongue talkers have gotten even more extreme in their teachings today. Bethel Church in Redding, California is a good example of this. Bethel Church is known for its large focus on miracles. They teach that all miracles described in the Bible can be performed by believers today and happen regularly, including faith healing of everything from curing cancer to regrowing limbs, raising the dead, speaking in tongues, casting out demons and prophecy. Their services may have congregants laughing uncontrollably, lying on the floor, shaking, staggering, screaming, and dancing, which they teach are signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Leaders claim to have witnessed angels appearing in balls of electricity that throw people into the air. One of the most well-known phenomena is a cloud of what is claimed to be gold dust or gold glitter that has been seen falling from the roof of the auditorium. The church has uploaded videos of it to their YouTube channel and calls it a glory cloud. From Bethel Church, Redding, California, on Wikipedia, https forward slash forward slash n dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash Bethel underscore church underscore Redding underscore California, accessed May 14th, 2020, these Holy Spirit manifestations are consistent with the Kundalini Yoga experience. They may be inviting the presence of the Holy Spirit to fill their church, but I would argue that it is the presence of a devil spirit that they receive. Paul warned the Corinthians about this very thing. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4 as far as their glory cloud is concerned, from looking at YouTube videos of this, it is clear to me that the gold dust or glitter is dropped by people into the auditorium's ventilation system. This is good enough to fool those who want these signs to be from God. 
All of this emotionalism is incredibly dangerous because it results in following doctrines of devils, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1, as these devil spirits influence church leaders into straying away from the truth. This is seen in one Bethel practice called grave soaking, in which members go on trips to lay on the graves of deceased revivalists in the belief that they would absorb the deceased's anointing from God. Furthermore, Bethel's music was among the most played contemporary worship music in American churches in 2019 and their albums have reached the Billboard 200 multiple times. Bethel Music have many songs with tens of millions of views on YouTube and two with over 100 million views as of 2019. It should not surprise us to learn that the live performances of their songs are characterized by their extended duration with lots of repetition and emotion. From Bethel Church, Redding, California, on Wikipedia, https forward slash forward slash n dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash Bethel underscore church underscore Redding underscore California, accessed May 14th, 2020. Also, the lyrics of these songs are lacking in quality. For example, You're Gonna Be Okay has over 34 million views as of August 27th, 2020. The song does not mention anything of God, Jesus, the Bible, or anything of the spirit realm. It basically says to be strong, hold on, put one foot in front of the other, follow the light in the darkness, a clear Masonic reference, and you're stronger than you know. The Bible contradicts this by saying that we are strong through Christ only when we are weak in our flesh, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10, and that God is strong in us, 1 John 4 verse 4. Dot. Therefore, the greatest danger from Bethel is probably the fact that their music is so popular among churchianity. The result is that they are leading millions away from God's word into the devil's emotionalism. Talking in tongues is easy. We should also note that modern tongue talking does not necessarily need to wait for the kundalini within you to be awakened by a guru, as with the Azusa Street Revival and with the Church of God. Now, you can do it on your own. One website gives the following five easy steps to praying in tongues. 1. Get distraction free. 2. Start trying. In short, start babbling like a baby. 3. Listen for hints. 4. Ask for increased faith. And 5. Don't overthink it. From 5 Easy Steps to Praying in Tongues HTTPS colon slash slash prayingmedic.com slash 2016 slash 03 slash 07 slash 5 dash easy dash steps dash praying dash tongues accessed May 12th, 2020. In other words, A.J. Tomlinson wasted his time waiting one year to receive the gift of tongues. He could have just started babbling like a baby to learn how to do it. The Church of God taught that following those steps would be committing the unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost, Matthew 12 verses 31 to 32. Isn't it funny how today's Pentecostalism has sanctioned what Pentecostals used to condemn to eternal damnation in hell? In summary, tongue talking is nothing but emotionalism and an effort to make oneself look good spiritually to others. It satisfies the flesh and has a form of godliness, which results in God's word and the things of God being set aside. Because tongue talkers rely upon emotions, they usually will not listen to sound doctrine, even if it is clearly presented to them from the Bible, because they would rather feel good about themselves than to see the truth that their own righteousness is as filthy rags, Isaiah 64 verse 6. A true college football fan in the South would never abandon his team, no matter how poorly they play, and a true Pentecostal will never abandon tongue talking, no matter how much biblical evidence is given to them. What the Bible says about speaking in tongues. Background. Since we should let God be true, but every man a liar, Romans 3 verse 4, we will let God's word be our final authority in this book. God's word is truth, John 17 verse 17, and God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2. Therefore, we will now look at what the Bible says about speaking in tongues and believe the Bible over all Pentecostal teachings. In order to understand what the Bible says about tongues, we need to do a quick Bible overview. In Genesis 11 verse 1, God said that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. 
Man united himself in rebellion against God by building a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11 verse 4. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined doing. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Genesis 11 verses 6 to 7. This is when God created confusion among the people of the earth by creating different languages. God has promised to gather all things together in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 10, which means that he must reverse the confusion of different languages by bringing the languages together in Christ. With regards to the earth, God said that all families of the earth would be blessed in Abram, Genesis 12 verse 3. The way this happens is that God will use the nation of Israel as a kingdom of priests to reconcile the Gentile nations back to God, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. God even says that, when he created the different languages in Genesis 11, he divided the world according to the number of the children of Israel, Deuteronomy 32 verse 8. The number of the children of Israel were threescore and ten, Genesis 46 verse 27, or 70, and there are 70 nations listed in Genesis 10. In order for Israel to reach the Gentiles for God so as to reconcile the earth back to God, Israel must be reconciled back to God first, which God promises he will do, Romans 11 verse 26. However, Israel has a history of unbelief, Acts 7 verse 51. As a result of Israel's unbelief, God states, in Leviticus 26, that Israel will go through five cycles of chastisement before they finally believe God. In the fifth cycle of chastisement, God says that he will scatter Israel among the heathen, Leviticus 26 verse 33. When the New Testament scriptures began with John the Baptist and Jesus, they preached the message to Israel to repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3 verse 2, 4 17. Due to the fifth cycle of chastisement, the Jews were dispersed among the Gentiles, John 7 verse 35. Both Jesus, Matthew 15 verse 24, and his disciples, Matthew 10 verse 6, were sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel so that they may be saved. Since they are dispersed among the Gentiles, they all speak different languages. Therefore, it makes sense that God would give the gift of speaking in tongues so that all Jews could hear the gospel in their own languages and be saved. Moreover, the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22. Note that, just before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he told his disciples, And these signs shall follow them that believe, in my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover, Mark 16 verses 17 to 18. The passage goes on to say that, after the Lord went to heaven, Mark 16 verse 19, the disciples went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, Mark 16 verse 20. In other words, because Jews seek a sign to confirm that the gospel is true, God gave new tongues as a sign that the disciples would use to show the lost sheep of the house of Israel that the gospel they preached would save them, Mark 16 verses 15 to 16. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, 1 Corinthians 14 22, Acts 2, speaking with other tongues. This is why, on the day of Pentecost, Believing Israel began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance, Acts 2 verse 4. Acts 2 verse 5 says that, when believing Israel spoke with other tongues, there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Acts 2 verses 9 to 11 goes on to list 16 nations out of which these devout Jews heard believing Israel speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God, Acts 2 verse 11. It is important to note that every man heard them speak in his own language, Acts 2 verse 6. Thus, speaking in tongues, as it was given in Acts 2, was not in some incomprehensible language, but it was in the language of the hearers.
all 120 believers at Pentecost, Acts 1 verse 15, spoke in other tongues, Acts 2 verse 4. Two points to note about this, one, it was not just a select few who felt the Spirit move, as is the case with Pentecostals today, and two, they did not speak in gibberish. I have personally attended many church services where multiple people spoke in other tongues at the same time. No one could understand any of it, because people were speaking different things at the same time. Even if they spoke in known languages, people still could not have understood them due to the fact that they were all speaking at the same time. Yet, here were 120 speakers at Pentecost, speaking in other tongues all at the same time, and every man heard them speak in his own language, Acts 2 verse 6. This is nothing short of a miracle, as no group of 120 people could spontaneously speak to a group of people who understood 16, different languages and have all of them understand in their own language the wonderful works of God that were being spoken, Acts 2 verse 11. You could not even have them speak one language at the same time because they would all be speaking different words at the same time, which would cause utter confusion. This had to have been a work of the Lord. Not only did God give the gift of tongues as a sign to the Jews to believe the gospel of the kingdom that the believing Jews were proclaiming, but tongues were also given as a practical matter. Romans 11 verses 25 to 26 says that, once the fullness of the Gentiles become in, i.e., once the rapture of the body of Christ takes place, all Israel shall be saved, for there shall come out of Shaun the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is a short work that the Lord will make upon the earth, Romans 9 verse 28, meaning that Israel will be saved by the end of the tribulation period. The reason for this short work is because the deception program of Satan during the tribulation period is so strong that, if God allowed the tribulation period to continue past seven years, there should no flesh be saved, Matthew 24 verse 22. Now, in Matthew 10 verses 4 to 6, Jesus told his disciples not to go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans. They were to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then, later on, Jesus said, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23. So how in the world, pun intended, will believing Israel reach all of the lost sheep of the house of Israel by the second coming of Christ when they are scattered among the nations, and believing Israel does not even finish going to the cities of Israel, much less the other nations? The answer is, the gift of tongues. Jesus said, For they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. But when they shall lead you, and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost, Mark 13 verses 9 to 11. So, the believing remnant of Israel is supposed to go from one city to another in Israel. Apostate Israel will deliver them up to councils, to be beaten, and to rulers and kings. Why? Because the gospel must first be published among all nations. It does not say. To all nations, but among all nations. Why? Because the lost sheep of the house of Israel are scattered among all nations. Perhaps members of believing Israel are saved Jews from all nations. They go to the cities of Israel, and they are extradited back to their original nations for trials. Regardless of how it happens, Mark 13 verse 9 states that they will be brought before rulers and kings, and this is how the gospel is published among all nations, even though they are only going through Israel. Note that, when they speak at their trials, they are not to plan out what they are to say. Rather, the Holy Ghost will give them the words to speak, Mark 13 verse 11. Remember what we noted regarding the gift of tongues in Acts 2. It is not that a person, who has the gift of tongues, started speaking Chinese or Spanish. 
Rather, it is the hearers of what they spoke who understood in their own language what was being spoke. Jesus said several times, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, example, Matthew 11, 15, 13, 9, 43. Jesus told his disciples that it is given unto you, believers, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, unbelievers, it is not given. Therefore, speak I to them in parables, because they see not, and they hear not, neither do they understand, Matthew 13 verses 11 and 13. In other words, God conceals his wisdom in such a way that only believers can hear and understand it, while unbelievers cannot understand it, Proverbs 25 verse 2, Isaiah 6 verses 9 to 10. This is what the gift of tongues in Acts 2 is all about. It is not about looking spiritual to others or feeling good about yourself. In the tribulation period, believing Israel will be arrested by apostate Israel and brought before rulers and kings of various nations, since the Antichrist controls the whole world in the last half of the tribulation period, Revelation 17 verses 12 to 13. When they are to testify, instead of telling of themselves, the Holy Ghost will give them the gift of tongues, and the Holy Ghost will speak through them of God's judgment and the gospel of how to avoid that judgment. The lost sheep of the house of Israel with the ears to believe will hear this clear message by the Holy Ghost in their own languages and be saved. Meanwhile, unbelievers will hear something different, otherwise, the unbelievers would not allow the believers to speak of judgment and the gospel to avoid that judgment, since the Antichrist controls the world. Therefore, the gift of tongues is all about speaking the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of Israel so that only the lost sheep hear the clear gospel and are saved, and the hearing in their own languages is one of the signs they need in order to confirm that the gospel spoken to them is of the Lord, Mark 16 verse 20. We know this to be the case because this is exactly what Acts 2 says happened at Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 2 verse 4. Devout Jews, Acts 2 verse 5, said, How hear we every man in our own tongues, wherein we were born? We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God, Acts 2 verses 8 and 11. Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Acts 2 verse 13. This shows that, those with ears to hear, heard the things of God in their native tongues coming from the 120 men. It was others, who did not have the ears to hear, who said, These men are full of new wine. In other words, to believing Jews, tongue-talking gave a clear message, while unbelieving Jews heard a bunch of nonsense and figured these people were drunk. This shows how two different groups heard the same message differently based upon their heart condition. Peter then said to the unbelievers, These are not drunken, as ye suppose, Acts 2 verse 15. In other words, the devout Jews, Acts 2 verse 5, who believed God, heard God speak through the gift of tongues. Therefore, the devout Jews did not think the 120 were drunk. Now, Peter is addressing the unbelievers who did not hear the things of God and what the 120 spoke. It is to these unbelievers that Peter says, Jesus of Nazareth, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, Acts 2 verses 22 to 23. This Jesus, whom ye have crucified, God has raised from the dead, set him at his right hand, and made him Lord, making these unbelievers Jesus' enemies, Acts 2 verses 32 to 36. You see, Peter had to preach this message of judgment to the unbelievers in Acts 2 verses 15 to 36, because they did not understand the tongue talking in 2 colon 4. He did not address them as devout men, out of every nation under heaven, Acts 2 verse 5, but as ye men of Israel, Acts 2 verse 22. The promise of eternal life for believing the gospel was unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, Acts 2 verse 39, i.e., the offer was to all Jews, including those scattered among the heathen. These scattered Jews are the other sheep, who Jesus must bring into Israel's sheepfold, John 10 verse 16, Latter Rain. Peter's explanation of the tongue talking was that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2 verse 16. He then quoted Joel 2 verses 28 to 32. 
Joel 2 verse 23 mentions that God hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain the first. Month. This passage is used by Pentecostals to say that we are now in the latter rain, which is the speaking in tongues that took place in Acts 2 and is taking place today. Is this correct? Note that Joel 2 is all about believing Israel entering God's kingdom on earth and God's judgment upon the nation for its apostasy. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, Joel 2 verses 1 to 2. But there is a great people and a strong. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Joel 2 verses 2 to 3. In other words, at Jesus' second coming, God will destroy apostate Israel and bring believing Israel into God's kingdom on earth. Therefore, also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Joel 2 verse 12. God calls Israel to repent so that they will be saved. You cannot say this is spiritual Israel, because 2.20 would not make sense, but I will remove far off from you the northern army. However, if you recognize this is literal Israel, it makes sense that God removes the northern kingdom of Israel from the southern kingdom of Judah, since Zion or Jerusalem is in the south. With this being said, God then shifts his focus to the land of Judah and their spiritual condition. Fear not, O land, Joel 2 verse 21. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, Joel 2 verse 22. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month, Joel 2 verse 23. There is the reference to the latter rain that the Pentecostals talk about. This latter rain is when God will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the cankerworm and the caterpillar and the pomerworm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, Joel 2 verses 25 to 26. This is a reference to a spiritual restoration for Israel, which begins during the at-hand phase of the kingdom for Israel. John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord, Matthew 3 verse 3, and the Lord gave his life to ransom believing Israel, Matthew 20 verse 28. This is how Jesus came into Satan's house in Israel, spoiled his goods, and bound him, Matthew 12 verses 29 and 44. What he was doing was cleaning the house of Satan in Israel for believing Israel to come in. You may say, how do you know that Joel 2 verses 25 to 27 refers to John the Baptist and Jesus? The reason is because Joel 2 verse 28 says that it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Peter quotes Joel 2 verse 28 and says, in regard to the Holy Ghost. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, Acts 2 verses 16 to 17. Since Joel 2 verse 28 says that the pouring out of God's spirit upon all flesh occurs afterward, then we know that John the Baptist and Jesus accomplished the things of Joel 2 verses 25 to 27, since they came to Israel just before the Holy Ghost was poured out in Acts 2. Note that Joel 2 never mentions speaking in tongues. Therefore, the latter rain is not tongue talking, it is pouring out my spirit upon all flesh. In John 7, the Holy Ghost is referred to as living water. Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me, and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, John 7 verses 37 to 38. John 7 verse 39 explains that this living water is the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. In the Old Testament, God's Spirit was given unto a select few for specific tasks, such as Bezalel in order to build the tabernacle, Exodus 31 verses 2 to 3, Balaam so that he blessed Israel, Numbers 24 colon 2, and David so that he would rule Israel well, 
1 Samuel 16 verse 13, not every believer received the living water of the Holy Ghost. Basically, what God is saying in Joel 2 and in Acts 2 is that the way that God will stay with Israel and Israel will not go into apostasy in God's eternal kingdom is that God will give all believers his spirit, not just a select few. The ultimate fulfillment of this is seen in the new covenant God makes with Israel at Jesus' second coming. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. Ezekiel 36 verses 26 to 27. This shows that the Holy Ghost was not given primarily to speak in other tongues. Rather, he was given to teach Israel the things of God. When Jesus first spoke of the Holy Ghost's coming, he told his disciples that the Holy Ghost would come to teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you, John 14 verse 26. This is how the Holy Ghost is the Comforter, John 14 verse 26, not by having you speak in other tongues. What comfort is that? What Peter is doing in Acts 2 verse 16 is that he is answering the allegation that the other tongues are a result of being drunk, Acts 2 verse 13, by saying that they are really from God. Note that God says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5 verse 18. When you believe God and His Word, you are sober-minded, Titus 2 verse 6, but the world thinks you are spiritually drunk because they cannot understand the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Thus, the gift of tongues was just a way to show if a person was sober-minded with the Holy Ghost or if they were drunk on the course of this world, Ephesians 2 verse 2. If Israel had come to God in repentance, Joel 2 verse 17, everyone in Peter's audience would have recognized what was spoken as the wonderful works of God in their own language, Acts 2 verse 11, rather than as nonsense speak of drunk people, Acts 2 verse 13. In fact, the other tongues would not have even been necessary because the truth of God would not need to be concealed from unbelieving Israel because there would not be an unbelieving Israel at the time. Joel 2 verses 28 to 29 says that, When God pours out His Spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also, upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. Look at Jesus' ministry. When He first came to unbelieving Israel, He spoke plainly to them, see Matthew 5 to 7. Then, they accused him of casting out devils by the power of Beelzebub, Matthew 12 verse 24. All of a sudden, Jesus began speaking in parables. The disciples said, Why speakest thou unto them in parables, Matthew 13 verse 10? Jesus said, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given, Matthew 13 verse 11. In other words, God speaks plainly to his people unless they are in unbelief. Then, he conceals the truth. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter, Proverbs 25 verse 2. Similarly speaking, God promised to pour his spirit upon all flesh, and they would speak the plain truth of God, Joel 2 verses 28 to 29. However, due to the apostasy of Israel, God concealed his truth with speaking in tongues such that believers heard the wonderful works of God and unbelievers heard a bunch of nonsense, Acts 2 verses 11 and 13. It is the same with the word of God today. Believers have been given the Holy Ghost to teach us the deep things of God, while the natural man receiveth not the things of God, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. For example, I can read 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 to 4 and learn that God's will is for me to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, while an unbeliever could read that same passage and not know what God's will is for him. God only gives his truth to those who will believe. I have had churchianity tell me that 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 to 4 does not tell us God's will for us today. This is why God had people speak in other tongues in Acts 2, when the prophecy of Joel 2 never mentioned the tongue talking, i.e.,
tongue talking was due to Israel's unbelief. Therefore, the latter reign of Joel 2 verse 23 is the pouring out of God's Spirit upon all believers in the at-hand phase of the kingdom for Israel and for God's kingdom on earth, as opposed to the former reign of the Spirit which only came upon certain believers for specific tasks. Speaking in other tongues is the equivalent of Jesus speaking in parables so that only the lost sheep of the house of Israel hear and believe the gospel. This is also borne out in Isaiah 28. There, the nation of Israel is said to have priests and prophets who have erred through strong drink, they stumble in judgment, Isaiah 28 verse 7. In other words, spiritually speaking, Israel's leaders were in apostasy. Therefore, God had to come to believers as babies who are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, Isaiah 28 verses 9 to 10. This is why with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, Isaiah 28 verse 11. The stammering lips are the parables of Jesus, and the another tongue is the speaking in other tongues. In other words, God set up priests in Israel who were to read God's word, understand it, and teach it to the people. Instead, Israel's leaders rejected the commandment of God so that they could keep their own tradition, Mark 7 verse 9. As such, Israel's pastors destroyed and scattered the sheep of God's pasture, Jeremiah 23 verse 1. Nevertheless, God promised to gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds, Jeremiah 23 verse 3. The way God did this was with stammering lips, Jesus' parables, and another tongue, speaking in tongues, Isaiah 28 verse 11. God set Israel aside. What is seen today is not a continuation of Acts 2. Remember that God told the disciples not to go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6. They were to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 10 verse 7, and do signs to confirm the gospel that they preach is true, Mark 16 verse 20, since the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22. Speaking with new tongues, Mark 16 verse 17, was one of these signs. If speaking with new tongues is still going on today, then why are not the other signs, which are to cast out devils, take up serpents, not to be hurt if they drink any deadly thing, and heal the sick, Mark 16 verses 17 to 18? Also, why don't all new believers sell their possessions, give their money to the church leaders, and live in a commune, as Believing Israel did in Acts 2 verses 44 to 47? And, if people lie about what they give, why are they not struck dead for doing so, as was the case in Acts 5 verses 1 to 10? In other words, if you believe that speaking in tongues is in operation today as a continuation of Acts 2, you cannot, 1. Divorce speaking with new tongues from the other signs, 2. Say that speaking with new tongues is for today, while communal living is not, Acts 4 to 34 37, nor 3, say that we speak in tongues today, but we do not recognize the ability of church leaders to remit or retain sins. John 20 verses 22 to 23, as Peter did in Acts 5 verses 1 to 10. But you may say, tongue talking does occur later in Acts, Acts 10 46, 19 colon 6, and Paul mentions it quite a bit in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. So, when did tongue talking cease? First, we need to understand, as we have already discussed, that tongue talking fulfilled Old Testament prophecy as the way that God would use unlearned and ignorant men, Acts 4 verse 13, such as the twelve apostles, to reach Israel with the gospel of the kingdom, since Israel's spiritual leaders were spiritually drunk on their own traditions. As we mentioned, this was all about getting Israel saved, since Israel was supposed to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles to reconcile all nations back to God, Exodus 19 verses 4 to 6. Once Israel is saved, they will go out to the Gentiles during the millennial reign. Then, ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you, Zechariah 8 verse 23. 
The problem is that Israel rejected the stammering lips of Jesus' parables when they used their wicked hands to crucify Jesus. Similarly, Israel rejected another tongue of the Holy Ghost when they stoned Stephen in Acts 7. The result was that Jesus stood up, Acts 7 verses 55 to 56, to judge Israel, Isaiah 3 verse 13. However, God did not give up on Israel, as seen in Stephen's statement, Lord, lay not the sin to their charge, Acts 7 verse 60. Israel was no longer God's chosen people, Deuteronomy 7 colon 6, 28 colon 13, but neither were the Gentiles. Now, the gospel of Christ would save everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, Romans 1 verse 16, not just the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Thus, God started a new dispensation with Paul in Acts 9 verse 23. Instead of preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4 verse 17, Paul preached to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Paul went, not to the Jews only, as the twelve apostles did, Matthew 10 verse 6, but he went to all unbelievers, the Gentiles, and kings, and the children of Israel, Acts 9 verse 15. Romans 11 verse 11 asks the question, has Israel stumbled that they should fall? The answer is, God forbid, but they fell anyway. Now, salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke Israel to jealousy. In other words, Israel stumbled at the cross and fell at the stoning of Stephen, but they can still be saved in the dispensation of grace. Since Israel did not believe, God brought salvation to the Gentiles apart from the Jews and is now using the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy so that they may be saved in the new dispensation of grace. Since the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, and God wants Israel to be jealous of the Gentiles, God gave the spiritual gifts of the Holy Ghost to the Gentiles. Therefore, speaking in tongues continues in the new dispensation, but for a different reason, i.e., to provoke Israel to jealousy, rather than to reach Jews in different nations with the gospel so that all the lost sheep of the house of Israel are saved at Jesus' second coming. This is why, the next time speaking in tongues is mentioned after Acts 2, is in Acts 10 verse 46. This is when the Holy Ghost fell upon believing Gentiles in the presence of believing Jews. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, Acts 10 verses 45 to 46. These Jews had to see the sign of tongues coming through these Gentiles in order to know that they had been filled with the Holy Ghost. Thus, speaking in tongues continues in the new dispensation that starts in Acts 9 verse 23, but the reason is to provoke Israel to jealousy so that they will see the Gentiles speaking in tongues and want what the Gentiles have. Israel would then believe the gospel and be saved in the new dispensation. <laughs>